Okay, so thank you very much to all of you and, and welcome to all attendees and, and panelists as well. Welcome to the session five of uh, High Peak uh, 2021, a virtual one, as you see, of course, uh, that's session on designing and scheduling. And we have uh, five uh, very nice papers uh, which are going to be presented to you right now. I'm just uh, uh, Olivier Zendra. I'm a tenured researcher at uh, INRIA in, uh, in Rennes, France, member of HIPIC Vision Editorial Board and of HIPIC Steering Committee. I've been working on program analysis, transformation, compilation, optimization, and I'm now working on cybersecurity. And now I'm going to uh, introduce the first author. Uh, the first paper is a, a RISC-5 simulator and benchmark suit for designing and evaluating vector architectures. And uh, Cristobal Ramirez is with us to present the paper. Uh, Cristobal Ramirez is uh, in uh, last year of the PhD in computer architecture at Polytechnic University of Catalonia. His uh, thesis work is focused on reconfigurable vector architectures. And he's also a research engineer at Barcelona Supercomputing Center, BSC, where uh, he is part of the RTL team in charge of developing a vector engine as one of the essential points to develop uh, power efficient and high throughput accelerators for the European Processor Initiative project. So uh, Cristobal, then the floor is yours. And if Eneco can start, please go on. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cristobal and I'm going to present this work uh, titled Array Five Simulator and Benchmark Suite for Designing and Evaluating Vector Architectures. Uh, well, uh, vector architectures uh, lack of tools for research. For example, Gen5, which is uh, possible the leading platform for computer architecture research, uh, doesn't have enough uh, support for vectors. Uh, for multimedia extensions, only present support for the Intel MMX and SSE, uh, which are uh, 128 bit extensions and which are quite old. And more recent extensions, such as the AVX 512, are not present. Uh, for that reason, uh, researchers uh, have to spend time developing its own platform uh, to meet their needs. Uh, on the vector architecture side, uh, more recently has been added support for the ARM SV, which allows implementations from 128 bits up to 2048 bits, and which, in fact, it's very nice, but limiting the possible scenarios which could allow uh, implementations with larger vectors, uh, such as the well-known uh, vector processors designed by, by NEC and Cray. Well, in that sense, uh, RISFI is opening new opportunities for the academy and industry with the incorporation of uh, this new vector extension. Uh, in fact, uh, this vector extension uh, has arrived uh, using the most convenient moment where the quest for extreme energy efficiency hardware uh, has renewed interest in vector architectures. Then, uh, as part of our research on vector architectures, we have implemented a parameterizable decoupled uh, vector architecture model uh, in, Gen in the Gen5 simulator, and we make it available for the community. Uh, on the other hand, uh, once you have a design, which application should be tested? Well, uh, the lack of vectorized benchmark suite is another limitation. Uh, then in this work, uh, we present a vectorized benchmark suite, uh, which for the moment is composed by seven applications uh, taken from different suites and which uh, were chosen according to their particular features. Uh, for example, uh, there are some uh, high yield applications which uh, scale very well as we increase the vector length, or there are uh, some others that use only short vectors. Uh, well, uh, before explaining the decoupled vector architecture model, uh, I would uh, like to give some basic background on vector architectures. Uh, well, exascale systems uh, will be strongly constrained by energy efficiency. In that sense, uh, CD processing uh, plays an important role in the development of the exascale systems. And this is because uh, an effective way to achieve high performance and efficiency is the exploitation of DLP. In this sense, uh, CD architectures can deliver good performance at lower cost. Uh, two variants. Two variants of CMD uh, are multimedia extensions and vector architectures. Uh, well, uh, multimedia extensions allow executing a set of predefined operations over vector registers of a fixed length. And nowadays, most community CPUs implement uh, architectures that feature CMD instructions. Uh, common examples uh, for multimedia extensions uh, are uh, AVX, AVX2, AVX512, uh, ARM-NEON, etc. Uh, in contrast, uh, in a vector architecture, uh, there is no single preferred uh, vector length. Just the maximum vector length is defined, and the application can use any vector length that doesn't exceed the maximum. Uh, moreover, instead of having, uh, let's say, a tier C2 functional unit to perform tier C2 operations simultaneously, uh, vector architectures typically pipeline the ALU to obtain good performance at lower cost. And one of the main features of the 
of the vector architectures is the vector register file, uh, where each vector register file can hold a, a large number of elements, and the maximum number of elements are represented by the maximum vector length parameter, which can vary depending on the hardware implementation. Also, uh, vector architectures that include uh, multiple lanes can produce two or more results per clock cycle, and adding multiple lanes is a popular technique that leads to an advantage in performance and scalability. Well, in a multi-lane vector architecture, uh, one lane operates uh, with a register subset of the overall vector register file and a functional unit subset of the overall functional units when, where uh, all the lanes work fully synchronized. Uh, furthermore, in a multi-lane vector architecture, it is needed uh, extra hardware to control the synchronization between all the lanes and also inter uh, interconnection uh, to allow data movement uh, between the lanes. Uh, for vector architectures, uh, we have the well-known uh, vector extensions for NEC and CRAE, and also uh, the new vector extensions, uh, RSVE and RISFI uh, vector extension, which also are considered as part of the return of the vectors. Okay, well, uh, now uh, the couple vector architecture model implemented in Gen5. Uh, here we can see uh, the model implemented in Gen5, uh, where most of the modules uh, can be configured. Uh, in this moment, uh, the, the vector engine can be connected uh, to the in-order core provided by Gen5. And well, uh, once uh, the, the model receives uh, vector instructions, the first step is to rename the instruction. In the renaming unit, uh, we can configure the number of physical registers. And uh, the next step, uh, we assign one entry to the row uh, in, the, in, the, in the order buffer. And also we send instructions uh, to the corresponding queue. It can be the memory queue or the arithmetic queue according to the instruction type. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the queues can be configured with the number of entries and also we can configure the issue scheme. It can be in order issue scheme or an auto for the issue scheme. Uh, the memory queue sends instructions to the memory unit. The memory unit is in charge to execute all the memory operations. It also includes the interface to the memory hierarchy. In the memory unit is defined a memory port which can be connected to the L1 cache or to the L2 cache. And it depends on the design. For example, it is usual that uh, designs for long vectors is connected to the L2 cache, while designs for short vectors are connected to uh, L1 cache. Well, regarding the, the lanes, uh, we can configure the number of uh, lanes in the design, and we also can configure the interconnection between them. In this case, we can see a ring uh, interconnection, but also we can change it by a crossbar. Inside the lane, uh, we can configure uh, the latency of the functional units and also the number of functional units in each lane. And uh, regarding the register file, we can configure uh, the maximum vector lane and also the number of read and write ports. Uh, well, uh, this model uh, is based on the RIS5 vector extension version uh, 0.7, uh, and at this moment, not all the features are supported, uh, leaving as a feature word the implementation of some instructions such as the atomic and the uh, register grouping. And uh, our goal is to integrate this work in the official Gen5 repository, uh, however, there is still uh, work to do. Uh, but for the moment, it is possible to, to have early access uh, in the link uh, shown below. Uh, well, the next tool is the vectorized page transfer suite. Uh, this suite is composed by uh, seven applications, Black Schools, Canal, Jacobi, Particle Filter, Pathfinder, Stream Cluster, and Subjects. Uh, we can classify these by the different DLP patterns, the regular, irregular, and mix of these. Uh, also, we can see uh, where the applications were taken from. Uh, well, uh, also we can classify these uh, applications according to some features, for example, the supported vector length, uh, short, medium, and large. Uh, for example, Black School supports uh, short, medium, and large, while Canal only supports short and medium. Also, uh, the memory uh, access type, uh, it can be unit stride, strided, and indexed. Uh, also, uh, the operations inside the lane, uh, it can be only arithmetic operations or, or also uh, operations with mask. Also, there are some uh, uh, applications that use the interconnection between the lanes. Uh, for example, there are instructions uh, such as the slides and reductions, uh, which uh, make use of this interconnection. Also, there are some uh, applications that uh, has intensive communication with the scalar code. Uh, for example, uh, if it's normal that after perform some reduction, uh, the final result is sent uh, to the scalar code in order to, uh, to perform some evaluation and iterates again or something like that. 
Uh, well, uh, we also perform an static analysis of each, each application and, and the evaluation of it. Uh, well, uh, here we can see uh, a table uh, for the Black School application. Uh, and here we can see uh, the total uh, number of scalar instructions for the scalar core, code, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, also for the vectorized code. Uh, we can see that as we increase the maximum vector length, uh, the, the number of uh, scalar instruction is reduced. Uh, also, we uh, calculate the percentage of vectorizations and the average vector length. Well, uh, also we, uh, we obtain the expected speed of uh, based on the data presented in this table. Uh, this uh, analysis was uh, done for all the applications. Uh, however, uh, here we are uh, showing only this uh, because of the time. Uh, well, uh, uh, also we perform a simulation of all the all the applications uh, rather than presenting approaches for the best performance. A discussion is presented that evaluates the results obtained in the static analysis and the results obtained when the applications are executed in the previously presented GFI simulator uh, with several vector engine configurations. Uh, for example, uh, here uh, 24 configurations. Uh, were evaluated for the vector engine, uh, first uh, from one up to eight lanes, uh, was configured, and by doing this uh, and setting only one memory port, it could be enough to feed up to eight lanes, uh, taking into account that uh, the catch line uh, is set to 512 uh, bits. It means eight elements, each 64 bits. And with every catch line request, it is possible to send a one element to each lane in an interleaved fashion. And also the maximum vector length uh, allowed uh, varies from 512 to uh, 16,384 bits. Uh, all the configurations implement renaming with 40 physical registers, uh, leading to vector register file size from the 2.5 2 uh, kilobytes up to 80 kilobytes uh, for the different configurations. Uh, we select the in-order issue scheme uh, also, uh, we uh, select only one uh, arithmetic unit uh, per lane, uh, and a ring topology uh, was uh, chosen. Uh, well, uh, the designer uh, is able to choose a simpler or more aggressive co configurations according to, to the research requirements. And uh, finally, uh, here we can see a figure with the final results where also uh, are compared with the expected ones calculated in the static analysis. Uh, for some applications, it is obtained a high speed up, uh, while for others, a poor speed up can be seen. Uh, this uh, can be for different reasons. For example, uh, one of the reasons can be that uh, the startup time, uh, which is the latency in clock cycles until the pipeline is full. Uh, uh, however, uh, different configurations could affect the startup time. Uh, for example, if we set a register file with only one port and we are executing a vector uh, multiply at masked instruction, means that uh, we need uh, to read four sources. Uh, if we uh, have only one port, then uh, four cycles are needed in, in order to read the, the four sources uh, before they start to execute uh, that operation. In contrast, uh, if we set up uh, four read ports, uh, this process can be completed in only one cycle. However, the cost uh, can be huge if you are thinking uh, uh, in a vector design of long vectors. Uh, well, uh, in our study, all of these things are discussed, and uh, I would suggest you to read uh, the paper if you are interested in, in more details. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Cristobal, for this nice presentation. So now we go to the questions. So um, all the uh, spectators, all the attendees are able to um, to ask questions in the in the chat, preferably, the Q uh, Q and A uh, window is a bit less convenient, I think. So, uh, Cristobal, we have a first question from Ram Rangan, which is: How does the RISC V vector extension differ from Cray's or ARM's extensions? And there's another one, which is: um, Is the simulator's microarchitecture modeling tied to the specific extension in any way? Okay, uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, more than differ from uh, Cray on ARM, I think that uh, ARM and RISC-V uh, are based on Cray. They, they took the best of that uh, uh, architecture, and uh, it was uh, how ARM also 
uh, uh, implements uh, the ESA and also RISFI. And uh, well, do you want to respond to the second one? Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, hello everyone. I'm Cesar. Um, regarding the microarchitecture modeling, so far uh, has been developed in order to to meet the the specifications in the RIX five uh, instruction set. And so it's not yet a generalized modeling, but well, we we can uh, have that in mind. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We have another question by Nathaniel Premilieu. How the benchmarks are vectorized uh, with auto vectorization compiler or by hand? Would it be possible to port this work to ARM SVE, for example? Uh, well, yes. Uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, the, the benchmarks uh, were vectorized by hand. Uh, at this moment, the, the vector compilers for RIS5 are not uh, too mature, uh, let's say. Uh, then uh, auto vectorization uh, in this moment is not a good option for, for RIS5. Uh, Regarding uh, the second one, uh, yes, it, it could be possible to port to ARM SVE. However, there are some instructions that are not present in, in other ISA. Then uh, that should be, a, of course, a changed by the, the equivalent ones in the other one. Uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, there are a, a common file where we define all the intrinsics. And uh, if you go to that, uh, to that file, you can uh, easily change the uh, the intrinsic for that for that instruction uh, for the specific instructions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have other questions there? Um, I have another question, which is uh, related to the the future work that you had mentioned in uh, in your work um about the um the uh, applications that have uh low uh, dlp uh but uh, large uh, mlv uh, on the hardware with large mlv so um you mentioned uh, designing for example a new control structure to keep track of the current location of every physical register to issue the instruction in a more intelligent way and avoid data movement as much as possible. Could you give, an, give us some hints on those uh, on this new uh, uh, structure that, that you would design? Have you, have you thought about it? Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, in this case, uh, the, well, the idea of that uh, uh, design is to try a uh, uh, to to set a reconfigurable vector architecture in the sense that uh, uh, how we can say uh, uh, there, there are uh, there are many problems when we are uh, moving data and moving data is very expensive in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and more in, in the case uh, in a vector register file uh, where the, uh, the, the register is uh, it can hold a lot of elements and then uh, to the, try to avoid these, these operations for example uh, when you have a uh, application with short vectors uh, you can use the the remaining space of the vector register file to to store or to do fast uh, swaps uh, in order to, to not send to memory and to, to keep all the data in the same place uh, by using the hardware that is not used in that moment because you are configuring your, your engine for short vectors. Then, uh, well, there, there are a lot of, of research uh, in this, uh, a lot of things to, to do in this, in this area. Uh, uh, well, uh, the idea of this, uh, of this work is to, to provide the tool uh, for for do that. So the first step. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I think we have to to go to the next presentation because we are a bit a bit late. Thanks again for your presentation and answers. And uh, now we will have the presentation on. Uh,
a conflict-free scheduler for high-performance graph processing on multi-pipeline FPGAs. And uh, Qinggang Wang is going to present um, this paper to us and answer a few questions after that. Um, Eniko, can you switch to the video, please? Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Meng Qinggang from Huazhong University of Science and Technology. I'm presenting this work and entitled a conflict-free scheduler for high performance graph processing on multiple pipeline FPGAs. Graph processing is ubiquitous in our labs, like information tricking, recommendation system, and so on. However, performing performing graph processing is extremely inefficient for traditional architectures, which inhibits random access to disk support only low memory level parallelism or execute only a few instructions per cycle. In contrast, FPGA can be regarded as one of the most promising hardware platforms for graph processing due to its fine-grained parallelism, low power consumption, and the flexible configurability, showing impressive resource. Therefore, most studies use multiple pipelines with the resource rep replication to accelerate graph processing on FPGAs. However, the multi-pipeline efficiency in FPGAs often suffers from the well-known data confidence in their on-chip VRAM, which can significantly worsen the overall performance achieved. We have conducted a set of experiments to contain the pipeline stores caused by data confidence. We can see that the percentages of the overheads introduced by the pipeline stores relative to the overall execution times increase as the number of pipelines increase for almost all graph algorithms reaching as much as 60% in the case of 16 pipelines. There have been several works on mitigating the performance overhead caused by the data confidence in FPGAs by reducing the number of confidence, elevating the automaticity overhead and uh, implying a par parallel conflict uh, management uh, scheme. In attention, trace banking predicts the interpipeline uh, data confidence through a trace driven address mini algorithm. In contrast, this paper focuses on eliminating completely all the data confidence on multi pipeline FPGAs to ensure efficient and scalable for graph processing for any graphs. We studied the underlying cause behind the inter-pipeline read-write confidence in FPGA-based graph processing accelerators where graph computation are often realized as SPMV, since SPMV can not only serve all for a high performance, but also ensure general generalization for graph processing. If we partition a match a matrix into multiple tiles vertically, then their destination vertex will be exclusive. No right confidence will occur if these vertical tiles are executed by different pipelines. Similar, all read confidence can be eliminated if horizontal tiling is applied. Therefore, our key insight is that the problem of any Minating inter pipeline read write confidence in, pre -proc in processing a graph can be turned into one of tiling its adjacency matrix. We have introduced a new approach with scheduler to completely eliminate all the inter pipeline data confidence with scheduler tells a graph induced adjacent matrix and then dispatch the sub-matrix tiles to all the available pipelines appropriately to achieve conflict-free graph processing. To fully reach the performance potentials offered by conflict-free scheduling, we have also introduced 
truly alter transformations to improve load balancing and uh, maximize the sequential memory access in processing the edge data in a graph. This, this object here is to tell a graph horizontal and vertical in order to ensure that each submatrix tail contains the same number of node zero elements as much as possible. To avoid data components, all concurrently execute submatrix tails at different pipelines must not contain any edge sharing, either the same row or column index. Our key observation is that the submetric tells that satisfy this requirement are often diagonal. Um, diagonal. Uh, therefore, we are motivated to ingest all the submetric tells in a diagonal major order to ensure our subsequent conflict flow uh, scheduling. No. We will eliminate all the inter pipeline data components by ensuring that all the concurrently execute sub matrix at different pipelines never share any common row or column index. High degree vertices in, re in real world graphs tend to have cons consecutive index. Their edges are falling into a few sub matrix tiles. In our tiling stage, leading to load imbalance, we propose to apply a vertex index renaming method to prevent high degree vertex from being assigned cons cons consecutive index. The agnol major scheduling in induces a new pattern of memory access. We propose to use a tail bit index-based data reordering method to uh, sequen sequentialize the, the access to the graph edges in our conflict-free scheduling framework. We compare with scheduler with state-of-the-art FPGA-based graph processing HEGP and for graph. The platform is a Stennis U250 accelerator card. We evaluate, uh, we evaluate uh, with scheduler on seven uh, real-world graphs and four graph algorithms. We first evaluate the performance of with scheduler against HGP and four graph. The above table gives the execution time and throughput re results. For 16 pipelines, we can see that with scheduler can achieve up to 3.57 GTAPs. With scheduler also runs faster the native scheduling HEGP and foregraph on average. Second, we analyze the overhead introduced by our pre-processing te technique. For such graphs, all the pre-processing times appear to be uh, reasonable. Uh, more important is that even with the pre-processing overhead content, we will schedule it still faster than native scheduling HEGP and foregraph. Third, we analyze the performance benefits contributed by its three te uh, techniques. We also demonstrate that with scheduler is highly scalable as the graph size and the pipeline count increase. We also evaluate with scheduler against the two state-of-the-art CPU-based graph processing systems, Ligra and GraphMat. We see that with scheduler seals better performance over uh, Ligra and the graph match. In attention, with scheduler is still able to show better energy efficiency over Ligra and the graph match. We finally compared with scheduler with the state-of-the-art GPU-based graph processing system, GONROC. Uh, with scheduler can still achieve com com competitive performance results. More importantly, we will schedule a report the power of only uh, 18 uh, watt, uh, showing a better energy efficiency over gun rock of 250 watt. Uh, fun, uh, in summary, we conclude a prehensive study to understand and investigate the inter-pipeline data confidence in graph processing accelerator from 
perspective of SBM, we, we present with scheduler, a conflict-free scheduler for uh, multi-pipelines that can eliminate all the read-write confidence in its on-chip VRAM for par parallel graph processing. Our evaluations shows that wave scheduler can run much faster than native HEGP and four graph scalability as the graph set and the number pipeline increase. Thanks very much for your listening. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Kong uh, Yang. Um, um, we are uh, we are not taking questions, so we have a first question on this, uh, which is: Does the pre-processing become cheaper when a part of the graph was has already been processed? For example, when updating a graph. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is an interesting question with regard to conflict-free scheduling on dynamic graphs. Uh, uh, thank you very much for point all. Uh, Wave scheduler correctly works on stick graphs, uh, but it can also be extremely easy for handling dynamic graphs. Two, there are two potential uh, approach uh, methods, uh, a street a straightforward method is to pre-process the update graph from scratch as long as the graph is changed dynamically. Uh, clearly, uh, this method introduces significant uh, pre-processing overhead. Uh, uh, another alternative is an incremental method uh, in which uh, we the the graph only once and uh, only need to handle the potential impact from update operations dynamically uh, up on the web scheduler framework. An incremental method can be implemented in a way that we use web scheduler to pre-process and graph as many ordered tells and then directly apply the updates on those related tells instead of the whole graph. Uh, however, uh, this may still cause a new uh, load balance, uh, load unbalance between tells, uh, which can be considered as an interesting future work. Thanks. Okay, thank you for this answer, a detailed one. Um, two questions from Ram. Um, impressive results, especially the, the ones comparing against uh, GPU-based implementation. So the first question is, do you know what makes FPGA-based processing uh, so efficient? That's the first one. And the second question is, you have mentioned uh, megahertz and uh, gigabytes per second. Uh, but what about the computational power between the FPGA and the GPU systems? Hello? Do you hear me, Quingang? Ah. Quingang, can you still hear me? Okay. We seem to have lost the speaker. Okay, so let's not wait for a long time. Let's give a few seconds. Uh, otherwise, um, for questions, if uh, Quingan is unable to come again, um, you will be able to ask them directly to the to the authors, to him or the other authors, of course, uh, by uh, by email. So, if he seems to have been kicked out, unfortunately, uh, then we will go to the next uh, uh, speech. Uh, which is um, the paper, a simple model for portable and fast prediction of the execution time and power consumption of GPU kernels. So this, this will be presented by Lawrence Brown. So Lawrence Brown is uh, since 2017, a PhD student at the computing system group at the Institute of Computer Engineering at Heidelberg University. 
Uh, his research interests focus on parallel programming, high performance computing, with a strong emphasis on GP GPU computing. In this area, he works mainly on improving multi GPU application development using compiler frameworks such as LLVM. Ah, we got Queen oh. back. Okay, good. Oh, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the no network. Problem. <laughs> no problem. So maybe a quick answer to, to the questions. Um, do you know what makes FPGA-based processing so much efficient? Uh, uh, I think uh, it's because uh, we we can design uh, we can design the uh, we can design uh, we can design the algorithm uh, more powerful. Uh, uh, FPGA uh, is uh, uh, can uh, conflict. Uh, by our uh, ourselves, uh, GPU uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, but uh, our resource have uh, have shown uh, our performance is uh, it is uh, complete with GPU uh, based uh, graph processing. Is not uh, have a higher performance uh, uh, com compared to GPU based graph processing. Uh, 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 that's all. If you you are interested in the question, uh, we can discuss it uh, offline. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Queen Gang. We will indeed go to the next paper. So I have already introduced uh, Lawrence Brown. And uh, so I go, yes, and go. Hello, and welcome to the presentation to the paper, a simple model for portable and fast prediction of execution time and power consumption of GPU kernels. My name is Lawrence Brown, and let's continue with the introduction. GPUs are essential for many power efficient supercomputers. Um, many uh, computers in the green 500 list use GPUs for their power efficiency and estimating time and power helps us to optimize implementations and to schedule the workloads. Um, why is another paper on this topic important? Um, many models already exist for time and power prediction, but not all of them are publicly available or they lack portability and creating Models for new GPUs requires great effort. So we built a portable and fast prediction model using only hardware independent features. We took 189 compute kernels and we used five different GPUs to build this model. And we have this hypothesis that um, when the kernels are well structured, behavior should mainly depend on the code. And a model trained on hardware independent features should be able to break this behavior. And all of this would allow to create models for new GPUs uh, much easier. So um, here's how the model is designed. <clears throat> we use uh, CUDA Flux to collect kernel metrics and we use them as hardware independent features. And we apply feature engineering to group instructions, for example, floating point instructions or control, control flow instructions. And we also compute analytical features like the global memory volume, which is being accessed. We use then uh, random forests to um, train the model. And we do this uh, with a nested cross validation with 30 iterations. And we train one model for each GPU. For time prediction, we uh, optimize the distribution of samples in the training and the test set. And this will ensure that uh, long running and short running kernels are in each set, which also improves the prediction accuracy. We evaluated our approach and we used five different GPUs. These are the K20 from the Kepler architecture the Titan XP and the P100 from the Pascal architecture, the V100 from the Volta architecture, and the GTX 1650 from the um, Turing architecture. We took samples from Rodinia, Parboil, Shock, Polybench, and we used um, 
as many different workloads as possible to get a large uh, sample database. But we uh, reduce this database then again for some applications that have uh, lots of samples of the same kernels uh, in order not to uh, bias the models against these applications. We uh, measure prediction accuracy and general generalization uh, by using the mean average percentage error and we do that on all poles of the nested cross validation. We also perform a leaf run out training to get comparable results for each sample and to identify uh, problematic samples. Then um, because we want to be able to make the predictions really fast, we analyze also the feature importance and this would allow us to leave uh, not important uh, features out and to gain speed during prediction. Here are the results for the nested cross validation. On the left side, so you, time, you see time, and on the right side, you see power. And the orange bar is the median, and the bottom of the boxes are the first quartile, and the top is the third quartile. And we see that the time prediction results are good with the exception of the GTX 1650, which has an error of 52%. For all the other GPUs, we are below 15%. Uh, and for the V100, uh, sorry, P100, uh, we are even as low as 8.8%. For power prediction, we are much better and we are below 3% for all GPUs, which makes us quite happy. Um, here are the results for the leaf one out and uh, for the time prediction. And we see that uh, long running kernels on the top left of the plot are usually underestimated because we only have a few of those long running samples and the model cannot learn them properly. And for the GTX 1650, usually um, the short running kernels are also often uh, overestimated. So these would be things that could be improved. For the power prediction, um, this is not that much the case, but we have some samples that appear to be outliers, but in reality, they have very similar features to other samples, but the outcome is um, different. So this might indicate that we lack some samples. Um, let's talk about the prediction latency. The number of estimators tells us how many trees are in the forest. And for the uh, time prediction, these are usually 512. For the GTX 1650, it's only half of that. Uh, nonetheless, the prediction latency is uh, nearly the same for all of them, around 108 milliseconds. For power prediction, we see the number of trees uh, varies from uh, 256 to 1024. And the latency uh, scales with uh, the number of trees, ranging from 15 milliseconds to 60 milliseconds. Uh, these numbers could be possibly improved by having a faster implementation and uh, also leaving out not important features which leaves us to the feature importance. Uh, the most important features for time prediction are threads per CTA. Uh, next comes uh, global, global memory volume and uh, then usually CTAs. Uh, but that is not the case for the K20 and the GTX 1650 there because uh, there are, are fewer uh, streaming multiprocessors CTAs are not that important, and instead uh, the parameter volume is more important. For power prediction, we also see that the threads per CTA are usually quite important. Um, also the CTAs, and then also the parameter memory volume. Uh, the number of CTAs seems to be especially important for the K20 and the GTX. Uh, we think that could have to do with uh, their low memory bandwidth and uh, they need more CTAs in order to be uh, power efficient and high latency and not 
idle doing no work. So uh, yeah, let's conclude this talk. Uh, we have a prediction accuracy that ranges from 8.8% to 13.8% for professional GPUs. The GTX uh, 1615 is the exception here. It has um, an accuracy of 52%. We think this is due to the dynamic uh, core and memory frequency, which uh, varies uh, much more compared to the other GPUs. For power accuracy, we have uh, results from 1.8% to 2.9% for all GPUs, which is quite good. And here the cross-validation results suggest that the trained models generalize well for time and power prediction and should be able to perform well when, for example, uh, scheduling. Yeah, uh, we conclude also that our hypothesis that uh, kernel behavior uh, should mainly depend on the code is true um, with uh, the assumption that the kernels are well-structured, locally optimized and latency tolerant and that models that uh, use only hardware independent features can um, predict the behavior in terms of time and power uh, with sufficient accuracy. Now, uh, let's see what the next steps could be. Uh, we could have more features that capture the degree of, of optimization in the kernel. Um, we also want to um, evaluate the model for actually uh, scheduling and see how it performs. And uh, the last point is that we want to have a static analysis of the kernel code for online metric collection. This would enable us to uh, predict the or to compute the features before executing the kernel in some cases and making the prediction without ever executing the kernel, which would also improve uh, scheduling capabilities. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you much. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenz, for a nice presentation. Um, so let's go for the questions. Uh, first question would be, despite the high uh, MAPE percentages, uh, does the model predict performance and power trends across GPUs? That is, uh, if ground truth is V100, is X person better than P100, how close is predicate predicted performance of V100 versus P100 to X person. Um, this is not completely clear to me, um, but does the model predict performance and power trends across different GPUs? Can you, can you answer that part? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for the first part, if you could uh, clarify the question a little bit more, I'm also happy to answer it. Um, so regarding the uh, software optimizations, um, yes, it's uh, possible in theory. Uh, however, since uh, the features are profiling based, uh, you would need to uh, run the optimizations uh, and also the, the unoptimized uh, kernel. So we have features for both, both versions. Uh, in some cases, it really depends on the uh, optimization. Uh, if the basic blocks are, or the control flow is not changed too much, uh, you could uh, maybe get the features without executing the optimized version, but um, I'm not quite sure if this is uh, always the case because of things like loop unrolling. So, so in that sense, it, it, is, it is difficult to extrapolate the performance of one, from the performances on one GPU to extrapolate the result on another one because there are too many differences in sense, um, specializations. Yes, uh, we train the model usually on only one GPU. Um, in theory, um, the GPU uh, used and uh, the capabilities like um, floating point operations per second and so on could also be um, features for the model, uh, but we haven't tried that yet. Uh, so I, I cannot really tell if this, it would work. Okay. 
Um, then there, there's, there was a second question, which is related to, to this. And so the answer is, is likely to be a bit similar, I guess. The question was, can this model be used to predict power and performance trends before and after software optimizations? So the first question was between GPUs and there it's before after software optimizations. Uh, yeah, I, I just said a little bit about that. So um, yes, it's possible, but both need to be uh, profiled and um, the trends should be uh, visible because uh, the uh, code obviously will change when it is optimized. Okay, thank you very much. Since we are a bit late, I think we will go on with the next presentation. Thank you very much, Lawrence, again for this presentation and your answers. Uh, the yeah. next presentation is by is irregular register allocation for translation of test pattern programs, and Min Su Kim is going to present this the the paper and then answer uh, all our questions. Feel free to put them in the chat uh, window, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Min Su Kim from Seoul National University. And this talk is about irregular register location for test pattern programs. Test pattern programs are written for testing theorems as one of its last steps in the manufacturing process. They run on, a, on an embedded system called ATE to generate a stream of bit vectors which contain the test. But the problem is there are multiple ATE models which have different programming languages and hardware architectures. Furthermore, the programs are written in low-level languages which access physical registers directly. Therefore, we need register allocation to run a program on various machines. However, register allocation for test pattern programs is somewhat challenging because the ATE is a highly irregular architecture, particularly due to interleaving units. When we say n-way interleaving, um, it means that the ATE is using n generators, each of which executes a given statement of the program. In return, they generate test patterns n times faster but um, the end statements in the major cycle are running concurrently. Such concurrency causes many challenging restrictions, which the traditional solutions, such as graph coloring, cannot handle without additional techniques. In this paper, we successfully formulate the register allocation problem with PBQP, and we divide a modified heuristic which works better than the existing ones, at least on the, on the test pattern programs. PBQP is an assignment problem. Given a PBQP graph with a cost factor for each node and a cost matrix for each edge, we have to determine the selection vectors um, which minimize the cost function F. The selection vectors are called selection vectors because they select the corresponding coast because it can only have zero or one as its entries, but only one of them can be one. So, and then the first um, term of the coast function sums the selected coasts for each node. And the second term sums the selected coasts for each edge. For example, here's the solution of the given graph. The highlighted numbers adds to the cost function, which happens to the minimal in this case. Um, as you may have noticed, finding an optimal solution is a MP hard problem. Actually, there has been a study that suggested register location can be reduced to the PBQP problem. Here's the idea. We make a node for each variable and then evaluate a cost for each case of allocation. For example, let's say variable X and Y interfere in the program. Then allocating them to the same register is illegal. So we assign the infinity to the diagonal of the cost matrix where allocating them 
to the same register. But spilling either or both variables would not be hindered. So the first entry of um, the matrix is zero. Instead, spilling a variable would code something. So the spilling cost can be assigned to the vector cost. As such, by extending the idea, we can represent the restrictions of ATE to a PBQP graph, then solving the PBQP problem will find the best allocation naturally. In the next slides, I will explain how we converted the ATE specific restrictions to the PBQP graph. The first restriction is register pairing. In ATE, there are certain combinations of registers which can be added together. The restriction is caused from the physical design of the circuit. For example, we can add A1 and A2, but we are not allowed to add A1 and B1. Therefore, if the given program contains an addition of variables Y and C, um, we can add the predefined matrix looking like this um, to the edge cost of the variables Y and Z. The predefined matrix is composed of zeros for legal combinations and infinity for illegal combinations so that the PBQP solver will try to select only the possible combinations of registers to allocate the variables Y and Z. Next, the restriction of register groups is related to the interleaving units we talked about before. Some registers are grouped together and the registers in the same group can be defined at most once within a major cycle. For example, um, if A1 and A2 are in the same group, the first code is not allowed because A1 and A2 are both defined in the same major cycle. On the other hand, if A1 and B1 are not in the same group, um, this code is allowed because um, they're not in the same group. So we can solve this by assigning some infinity entries to the edge codes. Um, if the given program contains multiple definitions in the same major cycle. So the variables um, for, uh, for the definitions can be uh, assigned to registers in the different groups. Um, for last, there's a restriction on the order of definition and use. Within a major cycle, a definition of a register cannot be located later than any use of the register within a major cycle. For example, the left code would be perfectly okay if it was a general program, but as a test pattern program, it is not allowed because the definition in line four is located after the use of it within the same major cycle. Um, which violates the restriction, even though the use in line three is not referencing line four, but they're in the same major cycle. So it's not okay. To reflect such restrictions, we detect all deaths and uses within a major cycle. And then as soon as we see a definition, uh, we add the matrix in the right to all the edges between the use, uses so far. And, and by doing so, we can assure that those two def and uses are not assigned to the same major, uh, to the same register. Now, since we've represented all restrictions as a PBQP graph, we can hand it over to a PBQP solver. Some efficient solvers have been proposed in the literature. The solvers um, usually take the strategy where they remove easy nodes first from the graph and the nodes with small degrees are considered easy because they require 
a smaller amount of computation for finding the optimal solution. But for hard nodes for which we cannot afford the computation, the solver instead takes a local minimum. Unfortunately, such approaches are not quite suitable for our PVGP graphs because they have um, similarly very high degrees and they, the, the entries are only zero or infinity because ATE does not support spills. Therefore, um, if the algorithm carelessly takes a local minimum, it might fail to find a valid solution, full solution even for the cases um, where it could if it did the right thing. For example, um, this is the example where a local view might lead to the total failure. So we devise a more elaborate, elaborate solver focusing on the enumeration of hard nodes which trades off the allocation time and the search space to find the solution still in a reasonable time. The modified solver defines a new term called freedom as the number of the zeros in the cost factor. Um, smaller freedom means that there is not many options for allocation, so it's harder to allocate. So, the idea is to perform the full enumer enumerations on hard nodes, and then we can apply the original solver to the nodes that are easier than the threshold MT. And for those easier nodes, the algorithm might take a local minimum, but statistically, they wouldn't be as critical. This plots the elapsed time for the various solvers. Given 11 PBQP graphs, produced from the real-world benchmark programs. The size of the graph ranges from 20 to 250, as shown in the right axis. And for each benchmark, um, the leftmost bar is the result of the original solver, and the uh, remaining four are the modified solvers with increasing threshold from one to four. The solid bars indicate that um, allocation succeeded, and while the others failed. As you can see, with the threshold increases, the time takes longer because we search the space more extensively. Um, but it's notable that with the threshold four, the modified solver could find all solutions for all benchmarks we have, while the time is still in the acceptable range. Then we also performed the stress testing. Here we started with 13 physical registers available, and then we removed a random register one by one, and then tried allocation with the reduced set of registers. Generally, when M decreases, it's harder to find a solution. So we can see the solvers start to fail at some point. But um, the configuration with MT is four, um, succeeded with all M's until it goes below five, which we found the actual, actual register pressure of the program. Um, to conclude, um, register allocation is needed for using a test pattern program on various machines, um, but the ATE is imposing some challenging restrictions which we successfully represented with PBQP and we also modified the existing, existing heuristics by focusing on hard nodes rather than easy nodes. And the modification outperforms the existing ones on real world test, word, test pattern programs. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Minsu. This this was very nice. So, do we have questions in the chat? Um, not yet. So, don't hesitate to ask questions. I will. I will start with uh, one or two on my own. Um, um, you mentioned in, in 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 the future work of of your paper, uh, indeed uh, the, um, the 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 dependency on, um, on on the on the quality of the solver, basically, 
And you mentioned that one promising approach would be to exploit machine learning based on deep neural network. Could you elaborate a bit more on, on, on this, please? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And I'm actually um, working on that project and it, um, it, it is based on the reinforcement learning, um, which we take, uh, we, we, we think of a allocation to a register is an action in the, in the reinforcement learning setup so that the agent would um, take an action by assigning a register to a node and they keep playing it and until all of the registers are assigned and they see if it's a, a success or failure, then we can give a reward based on the wizard and then the, the reinforced learning agent will learn how to um, assign a register to make it, um, to make the possibility higher so that um, the register allocation quality would increase uh, in eventually, yeah. Okay, thank you. This sounds indeed promising. And there was another uh, lead that you mentioned. Uh, we said that when it was impossible to uh, allocate register for given programs, then maybe some changes the, in the source of the program, such as in, in the program source, such as the loop and rolling, uh, could improve the chance of register uh, allocation by loosening the constraints, basically without affecting the program correctness. Uh, have you looked into this uh, already? Um, um, and, and also with the, uh, the, the uh, advantage that this brings, but also the fact that it has ad adversarially uh, affect uh, the code size, for example. Um, have you been able to look into that already? Oh, uh, yes, we, we um, believe that that approach would be um, we're very promising, but um, we still haven't found um, uh, an elegant solution to that because, um, like, most of like we could use some um, optimization skills like code motions or like something else, but they would be still not perfectly um, harmonized with the AT specific features yet so we are still working on it but we believe that that's a possible direction to it thank you okay thank you very much um no more questions let's go to the next speech so thank you very much for your presentation and answer minsu and now we go to uh, the paper zero ploit Exploiting zero valued operands in interactive gaming applications. And Ram Rangan is going to, to present um, uh, this. Oh, uh, sorry, Minsu, I think I forgot to introduce you before. So you're pursuing a PhD in Seoul National University, South Korea, working on web engine and compiler optimization. My apologies for this, Minsu. Um, now back to Ram Rangan. Ram Rangan, who's going to present now. He is a principal architect at NVIDIA, uh, where he focuses on graphical application performance and identifies software and hardware enhancements. Uh, before joining NVIDIA, he was a researcher at IBM's Austin Research Laboratory, working on various compiler architecture topics. And he, he had a PhD, he has a PhD uh, in computer science from Princeton. Uh, Ram, please. Hello, my name is Ram Rangan. Um, today I'm going to be presenting some work that uh, colleagues and I have worked on at NVIDIA. It's titled Zero Ploit and it appeared in the August 2020 issue of TACO. We start out by studying value locality in computer games. Uh, what value locality is the likelihood of repetition of values for a given operand. Uh, we implemented a value profiler uh, and we found that a tiny 15 entry histogram uh, associated with every single instruction is able to capture 25% of all dynamic 32 bit values that that instruction ever produces. Now, this is a very interesting result, but what is more interesting is that 11% of those destination register rights, of all destination register rights, they are zeros. We rely on this fact to build 
our optimization called Zeroploit. Zeroploit uh, works as follows. If there is, let's say, a multiply operation or, or any similar operation, but uh, let's take a multiply for now. Uh, if there is a multiply A comma B and A is zero dynamically, then uh, our, the key insight is there is no need to compute B because the result of zero times anything is going to be zero. So we then transform the code as shown here in the right bottom. Uh, we introduce a branch which checks, which checks to see if A is zero dynamically. And if it is, uh, execution proceeds to a specialized path where we simply write zero to the destination. Else, we then compute the expensive subgraph for B and perform the actual multiplication. Now, uh, folks familiar with uh, floating point rules might, might object to this, uh, this optimization, right? Because zero times nan or zero times negative or positive infinity is not zero according to IEEE floating point rules. However, game developers, uh, they do not care, right? They, in fact, explicitly grant permission to compilers to perform these specific optimizations, uh, one, uh, for two reasons. One is to improve and, and squeeze out as much performance as possible for their games. And two is they do not want uh, NANs, however rare they may be, uh, to leak into the final render target. So for these reasons, game developers, they permit these IEEE unsafe optimizations, and we take full advantage of it for zero ploy. So this transform gives us about a 3% uh, frame level speed up. And at the individual shader level, this amounts to 36%. So we try to answer the question, why is zero so popular? Um, to, to do that, we need to separate zero writers into two categories. One is what we call zero propagators and the other is zero originators. Zero propagators, as their name suggests, merely propagate zeros due to their semantics, right? Uh, for example, a multiply operation can um, propagate zeros um, in its input to its outputs. Whereas zero originators, they produce zeros from non-zero inputs. Uh, texture lookup or a memory lookup in general is a good example, right? Uh, shown here on the left bottom is a dynamically created texture during the rendering of a frame from uh, Battlefield Five, uh, a popular game. All texture lookups going to the black areas of this texture, they will return zeros dynamically. Um, the second category is saturating arithmetic. Saturating arithmetic caps results between zero and 1.0. And as a result, a lot of, I mean, all negative values, they become zero dynamically. And, and thirdly, we often see cases where floating point mins and maxes, they use zero as, as the capping value. And that also, again, produces uh, zeros dynamically. Now, when a zero originator's destination register feeds into a zero propagator, that creates the right conditions for zero ploid. Right, so uh, as shown here in, in this example, there is a saturating multiply shown in green, which is a zero originator. And let's say the value profiler also indicates that this has a high enough zero probability. Now its result R10 is used in this simple multiply operation, which is a zero propagator. And because R10 has a high probability of being zero, we can now conditionally uh, do the calculation for R11, uh, which it turns out is the result of a texture fetch, right? So uh, the idea here is there needs to be a zero originator and a zero propagator, and then we can consider that as a potential candidate for zero ploid, provided their dynamic value profiles um, indicate uh, the, that the conditions are favorable. To get into slightly more detail on how Zeroploit works, uh, consider this data flow graph uh, shown here. Uh, traditional value specialization optimizations, they perform only forward slice specialization because they are focusing on generic values. So uh, if let's say instead of a zero originator, if we had um, some other known generic value, then a forward slice specialization logic would merely 
attempt to specialize this sequence of multiplies, uh, which form the forward slice of, of that operation. But zero is very special. Now, in addition to specializing the forward slice, we can now decode eliminate each of the backward slices of the other operands of those multiplies. So one of the operands of the multiplies is known to be zero, then we can dead code eliminate the backward slices of the other operand, right? So this ability to perform both forward and backward slice specialization is, is unique to Zeroploid and is its main, um, main um, selling, selling point. Uh, so once we have identified the opportunity, in order to realize the transform, it's important to construct what we call a versioning scope. And so when determining the versioning scope, it's important we create as large a versioning scope as possible so that as much of these backward slices get captured in that versioning scope. The larger the versioning scope, the more is a specialization benefit. And, and therefore you will see a higher speed up because of zero ploy. That said, there are issues with, with large versioning scopes and, and we discussed those in our paper. Uh, but to, uh, to a first order, this is how one would approach uh, a, a zero-ploy transform. It is to be greedy and, and try to specialize maximally. So once the versioning scope is identified, the transform itself is pretty straightforward. We introduce a branch which would dynamically decide to jump either to the fast specialized path or the unspecialized slow path, and then execution would proceed as normal outside this region. We implemented this transform manually on several shader programs in our suite of applications. This was all done at the DX bytecode level, the DirectX bytecode level, which is a high level assembly. And uh, based on offline value profiling, as well as offline analysis of, of those value profiles. Uh, as you might imagine, this involved a lot of trial and error uh, for, for some shaders. For others, it, it worked uh, pretty well out of the gate. Uh, one interesting thing that we noticed was there was a category of shaders which uh, suffered from high SMPT divergence penalties. They were very sensitive to SMPT divergence penalties due to the versioning branch that we introduced. So in those cases, we had to introduce an explicit vote instruction to make sure that we branch only when all the threads of a SMPT what they are in agreement. But there were other cases, namely texture or memory bandwidth limited cases, where introducing SMPT divergence did not really hurt performance, but actually the savings in memory accesses in the specialized path, even if it was in a divergent code path, that actually helped performance. So um, developers or, or compiler uh, writers should be aware of, of this distinction. We found that on, a, on an RTX 2080 GPU, uh, our manually transformed shaders uh, performed quite well. We got about 3% uh, average speed up uh, at the whole frame level. And at the individual targeted shader level, we got a 36% average speed up. Uh, so that brings me to the end of this talk. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that Zeroploid is an, is an interesting um, transform that, uh, that you, you would like to dig into yourself. Um, this can be implemented either by developers uh, working on performance critical codes, provided they have access to a value profiling infrastructure, or automatically by a PGO compiler, a profile guided optimizing compiler. Now, uh, we've done some limited progress towards enabling this as a full fledged automatic PGO. Uh, we've done some cross validation testing as shown in the paper and as shown here on the right. But a lot more work needs to be done before we can bring Zeroploid to NVIDIA drivers. So as a first step towards that, I'm, I'm happy to announce that uh, our work on developing an automatic transform for Zeroploid has, has now been accepted into the Compiler Construction Conference and is, is slated to appear uh, in early 2021. Uh, I, I strongly uh, encourage you guys to check it out. Now, um, outside of our plans uh, for bringing Zeroploid uh, to, to the NVIDIA drivers, uh, one other potential future direction would be to explore Zeroploid outside of gaming applications. So it would be great if, if researchers could study not only the performance upside, but also the functional impact 
from allowing zero ploid as well as IEEE unsafe floating point in, in other domains like HPC, multimedia, or machine learning. Um, and uh, it would be nice to see um, zero ploid uh, extend beyond gaming applications. Thank you. Uh, I'm now happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, Ram, for, for this very clear presentation and very nice piece of work. I very much like it. Um, you, we're going to dig in the, in the questions, but uh, uh, I'm going to start with one of my own, but you, you, you started answering it in, in your last slide, basically, which is you said that you would like very much to have zero ploid uh, um, expand beyond the gaming indeed. Um, and, and so you mentioned that there, there were uh, explorations to be done there. And, and my question was indeed, how, how, how much generalizable do you expect your approach to be, to be there? Um, uh, so indeed, um, there, are, there are many, many things that have plenty of zeros everywhere, basically in computing. When you look at the way um, objects are stored or represented in memory and, and all this, um, but of course, not all zero end up in as operand of a multiply. So do you have any hint of how much applicable this is likely to be, or is it just completely fuzzy for now? Um, I'll be honest, I have not studied this outside of gaming applications. Um, so uh, I think anyone approaching this problem has to do a similar sort of evaluation about how often these zero originators are being consumed by zero propagators. I think that is going to hold the key mm -hmm. to the potential of, of this optimization. Uh, one other point there, which I mentioned in my slides is, is the possibility of, uh, of applying this in, in, the, in the approximate computing world, right? Where they may not quite care, especially things like neural network training because eventually everything gets trained. So uh, it's, it's okay if we can take advantage of uh, zero weights or zero valued activations to short circuit some of the back propagation um, type things, which, which is, I mean, it's, it's a popular thing yeah. in, in, in our field right now. Everyone uh, wants to do something related to neural networks. And so that is something sparsity, exploiting sparsity to avoid computations would be an exciting uh, new direction uh, for, for people to pursue. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I especially like the, the backward slice, basically uh, the propagation. That's, that's very key to your, uh, to your approach. So we have another question, uh, which is, can you give an estimate what the online profiling overhead would be? Um, so that requires um, a lot of engineering. We are in the process of doing that, but just to give you a, a foreshadow of this, this work, uh, which, is, which is still a work in progress. Uh, one thing that we have come to realize is it's not possible to collect the values in a single frame, right? Uh, game, gamers are going to be really unhappy with us if we do this, this type of a profiling. Mm -hmm. So we are going to resort to sample profiling across multiple frames of a game. Mm -hmm. um, so it will incur a tiny bit of overhead uh, and, and then over several frames, we will build a large enough corpus of profiles, which we will then use to optimize. So in that sense, the overhead can be driven down arbitrarily. If, if you are the type of gamer who doesn't mind like a 5% overhead, like for the initial half an hour of gameplay, then sure, uh, that is the time it takes for online profiling. On the other hand, someone else may just want this to happen in the background, so they can take two hours to perform the profiling, but uh, after that, their games will, will run, whatever, blazing fast, 3% fast. Um, so that's the, the trade-off there, the sampling-based approach, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Yes. Any any more questions on this? No. So the, the presentation was indeed very clear, and the, 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 the work is a very nice body. So thank you very thank much, you. Ram. Thank to all uh, the speakers and the, the attendees of uh, of this uh, session. And I hope you you have been enjoying High Peak 2021 uh, as much as I have, or even though it's a virtual one for, because of COVID, of course. And uh, thank you very much for joining in this session and maybe we'll see each other in other sessions. Thank you, bye-bye, take care. <laughs>